Church, if you would please open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 15 through 29 is the text from God's Word that we will focus on this morning. We'll read that text together in its entirety as we move throughout the service this morning. For the last three chapters of Galatians, chapters 1, 2, and 3, we have said and seen in the book again and again that we are saved by faith and not by works of the law. We're saved by faith in Christ and not by either works of the law or any other works that we might do. So the question that follows that, maybe it's a natural question that comes to your mind, is why then the law? Why, why was the law of Moses given if we're not saved by the law of Moses? We learned uh, from reading Galatians previously that Abraham was saved by faith. And that's how God meant it to be for him and his descendants and now for us who uh, are, are believers in Christ. But then, uh, a little over 400 years after this promise was made to Abraham that he would be saved by faith, came Moses and came the law of Moses. And God said over and over again in the law and to the Israelites, you need to keep my commandments. Here are my commandments. Keep them. And the Israelites sometimes tried, but most of the time didn't try very hard. God said over and over again, obey my law, keep my commandments. The Israelites read this in the, the word of the law, the Torah, in those first five books of the Bible. They read that they needed to keep God's commandments, and they heard it over and over from their parents and their grandparents and their, the priests and the leaders of their nation, or at least they should have been hearing it, for 1,500 years before Christ came. Keep the law, obey the law, observe my commandments. Why did God give them the law? Tell them so often that they must follow it if they can't be saved by following it. If following it gets them no closer to having that renewed relationship with God than not following it. It's clear to us, especially after having read Paul's letters in the New Testament, and after hearing what Jesus taught his disciples, it's clear that no Israelites could have possibly been saved by keeping the law perfectly. Because no one is perfect, and everyone breaks God's law. So why did God give the law in the first place? Here's another question I have for you, and this one might strike a little closer to home. Why is the law of Moses important to us as Christians? If we aren't saved by following the law of Moses, if we don't have to follow that law strictly, like the Israelites were commanded to, why is it so important? Here's an example. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 through 12. Deuteronomy 22, verse 9 reads this. Here's a portion from the Law of Moses, commands given by God to Israel. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear clothes of wool and linen mixed together. Israel, don't do it. Don't wear polyester. Um, don't wear polyester. If you shall make your, uh, you shall make yourselves tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. You've got to wear tassels. We as Christians, if you're trying to read through the Bible, you quickly come up on the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible, and you read these commands and you say, "I'm a Christian. Why am I?" Reading this, why does this apply to me? You read through portions of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, and you see instructions on how to perform a grain offering. Painstaking detail instructions. Here's how you make a grain offering. And maybe you scratch your head and think to yourself, why is this in the Bible, and why am I reading it as a Christian? Of course, we know that it's God's Word, and, and we love God's Word, knowing that it gives us life. And it's beneficial to us every time we read it. But we say, is this portion really as beneficial as the others? Why am I reading this portion when I could be camped out in the book of Matthew for three years? These kinds of thoughts are perfectly normal for a Christian. They're the kinds of thoughts you think of when you first come upon the book of Leviticus and you're reading through it and you're reading through instructions on, on how to make a grain offering. 
or a sin offering or a guilt offering or an offering for the Passover. And you say, we don't even celebrate the Passover. Though they're normal thoughts, they're, they're still thoughts that we need an answer to. And there's still questions that we wonder. And sometimes at the end of the day, we feel like we never get an answer. Paul is writing to some people who are struggling with whether or not they need to follow the law. And Paul tells them, you are saved by faith and not by the law. So then Paul poses the question himself. He says, why then the law? Why, why do we have the law and why is it there? Paul asks this very same question and answers it in Galatians 3, verses 15 through 29. By the end of the section we'll read together this morning, Paul will give us an answer to that question. Why, why the law? Why do we have it? And why should we care about it? But before we answer that question, before we see how Paul answers that question, he dwells on that question for a minute. He, he thinks about it and, and churns about it and teaches about that question first and gets our hearts ready to hear the answer. So we're going to do the same this morning. Let's dwell on that question together with Paul for a minute and then get to the answer a little bit later in our time together this morning. So if you would please turn with me to Galatians 3, verses 15 through 19. We'll read those first four verses together. Um, and then after that, we'll continue on and read the rest of it as we go along. So let's hear from God's word. Galatians 3, verses 15 through the beginning of verse 19. The word of the Lord says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant... No one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For, the, for if the inheritance comes by the law... It no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? Why then the law? We'll stop there for now and pray, having heard the word of the Lord, and we will pick up from there in a little while after we go back to verses 15 through 19 and dwell on them for a minute. So let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises made to Abraham and then extended to us through Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we can be called your sons and daughters in Christ. We thank you that you have saved us who have faith and that you make us an heir of those same promises through faith. Oh, Lord, we love you and we praise you and trust you. We ask, Lord, that you help us to understand your word this morning. Help us to understand uh, the answer you give us to this question, why the law? Why the law of Moses? Why is it there? Help us to understand. Help us to seek after you and to open up our hearts to you and what you would lead us to think, to do, and how to react. Again, Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we glorify you with all that we are and all that we do. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So let's look back at the text again and dwell upon this question that we see Paul raising in the first four verses here. Why then the law? We're going to see in this first section that Paul says the law does not cancel the promise made to Abraham. The law does not cancel the promise made to Abraham. Covenants are not designed to be broken. Uh, just like in our day, contracts are not designed to be broken. You write up a contract for the purpose of both parties holding to that contract. And you can't just on a whim uh, change the, the, the stipulations of that contract after it is signed. There's penalties built into contracts for people who break them. Paul says that in the human world, covenants are not meant to be broken. That comes from the very nature of a covenant or the very nature of the kind of contracts we make. The two people who are signing it say, these are the terms I will live by. And they stick with them. If you sign a contract in our time, that contract is binding. You can't just set it aside whenever you want to. So Paul refers to human covenants and human contracts, if you could call it a contract. It's similar in some ways to a contract and different in others. But uh, he says when you're thinking about human covenants, they're not just set aside. 
so much more so the covenant that God made with Abraham. It is not set aside by the law of Moses that comes afterward. Look at verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, and they are not nullified by the law. Look at verse 17. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul, does not make void, does not cancel a covenant that was previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. God made a covenant with Abraham. He said, Abraham, if you have faith in me, then you will live in your descendants, uh, through your descendant, excuse me, all the nations will be blessed. Through your offspring, every nation of the earth will be blessed. Paul says that this promised blessing that comes through the offspring, not the offsprings, but the offspring, is referring to Christ. That God would bless all nations through one descendant of Abraham, and that descendant is indeed Christ Jesus, as Paul explains to us here. He quotes from the Old Testament and says, and to offsprings referring, uh, he does not say into offsprings referring to many, but referring to one, and your offspring, who is Christ. So God promised Abraham that he would one day send a descendant to come into this world and to save the world from their sins. All Abraham, do, had, all Abraham had to do to be a recipient of this promise and be included in in this promise with God is that he must trust God and have faith in God. If he did so, he would be a recipient of the promise of God. 430 years after God made this promise to Abraham, have faith in me and receive the promise, God came to the people of Israel and made another covenant with them. And in that covenant, he listed out a set of laws that they are to follow. And we call this covenant, we call this set of laws, the law of Moses. Paul looks at the law of Moses and he says, look, this covenant that came 430 years afterward, it does not nullify or cancel the promise made to Abraham. Abraham still has that promise. It's not canceled. It's not nullified. Just like we can't nullify a contract by simply saying, oh, I made a contract with someone else right after I made one with you. No, the promise is still valid. The contract is still valid. The promise still stands. So, too, everyone who has faith like Abraham's faith will be saved according to the promise given to Abraham. But as we have seen before, Jews came into the region of Galatia, and they were claiming something different. They were claiming that everyone who wants to be saved in Christ must first follow the law, becoming part of God's ethnic people before they can become part of God's uh, spiritual people saved in Christ. The Jews in Galatia were claiming that everyone must follow the law to be saved. Paul rejects this completely in verse 18. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he says the, the promise to Abraham is not invalidated. It's not canceled. It's not nullified by the coming of the law of Moses. And then he says, therefore, those who have the inheritance by faith still have it. It's not compromised or negated by the law. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but instead it does come by promise. The end of verse 18. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So he's further defending this point he has been made that salvation comes through faith and not by obeying the law of Moses. If the law were to invalidate the promise to Abraham, and if it is true that we must follow the law to be saved, then our inheritance, the one that we're supposed to receive for having faith, is in dangerous jeopardy. And we're in serious trouble. If we must follow God's law to be saved, then you are in trouble, and I am in trouble. Everyone is in trouble, from the old of us, oldest of us down to the youngest. The problem is we have all broken God's law and all deserve God's wrath and the punishment that rightly comes from breaking his law. But thankfully, brothers, it is not the case that the, the promise to Abraham is invalidated by the law. It's not the case that we must follow the law because Christ Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, making it possible for us who have faith to receive the promise. 
The law does not nullify the promise. The promise was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. He was the descendant who came to fulfill that promise made to Abraham. And all those who have faith inherit the, the terms of that contract, if you will, inherit the promised Holy Spirit if they have faith in the Son whom God sent. The law that came later did not change the covenant with Abraham, and praise God that it didn't, because now we get to inherit the Holy Spirit because of that promise. Mm -hmm. Imagine, church, you go and you buy a house. Oh, you search for the perfect house and you find it. It's a beautiful one. It's got all the space you need. It's got uh, a nice, nice uh, interior, hardwood, whatever you're looking for, this house has it. You find the house and you love it and you apply for a mortgage and you get accepted. You meet with your realtor and you meet with the other owner and you sign all the paperwork, right? You sign it all. The deed to the house is signed over to you. It's yours. You've signed it. You've agreed to it. And the previous owner, uh, he's now called the previous owner because you've done all the paperwork, right? You've got the deed. He says, hey, I'll meet you at the house tomorrow morning and hand you over the keys. And you say, fantastic. We'll meet you there uh, at the, the, the time that we arrange. We'll meet you there. We'll grab the keys. So you go home and you're excited. And you go to sleep and you wake up eager to go get the keys to your new house and to walk into it as the owners for the first time. You pull up to the house and you see there's another couple there who are excitedly talking to the previous owner and are, are uh, looking at the house as if, if they can't wait to move in. And you get a little bit confused and puzzled and the previous owner of the house walks up to you and says, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, right after we agreed on this, these other owners came, these other potential buyers came. They wanted to pay me more money. So I'm just going to I'm just going to let them have the deed to the house. I'll let them sign the paperwork and I'm going to give them the keys and you can't have this house. Obviously, that doesn't happen. <laughs> That's not how buying a house works. You can't sign all the paper. You can't own a house and then have it negated or nullified by the owner selling it to another person after you have done all you need to do to take ownership of the house. If you've signed the paperwork, if you have made that covenant to own the house, the house is yours. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question this morning. Have you been saved along with Abraham? Have you received the same promise that was given to him and taken part in that inheritance that was promised to him long ago? God says to us, all who have faith in Jesus are heirs with Abraham of the promise. We are all sons and daughters of God if we just believe. So brothers, believe. Repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus for you need him to be saved. Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins and was raised again to new life so that all who trust in him share in that new life and partake of the Holy Spirit along with all those who have faith. I want you to know, church, that once you have received that promise, the promise cannot be taken away. So for those of you who have believed, here's the good news for you. Your inheritance, the Holy Spirit, the promise, that salvation you have in Christ cannot be taken away from you. You have a guarantee of that inheritance. You have a guarantee of that salvation, that promise given to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can nullify the salvation that you have in Christ if you once believe and trust in God. No other covenant, no other sin on your part or on anyone else's part, no deception of the enemy, no lies or trickery can separate you from God and take away that inheritance that you rightly have in him, in Christ, through faith. Oh, brothers and sisters, this should be comforting. This should make you feel warm inside. If I but trust Christ, then nothing can take away my inheritance from me. That salvation given to me through Christ. Once we're saved, nothing changes that. Is this something that comforts you when you hear it? When you're going through tough times, are you comforted knowing that through faith you have an inheritance that can never perish, can never be taken away? You have entered into a promise, a, a relationship with God as his son. And that sonship, sonhood, whatever you would call it, cannot be stripped by anything, even by your own sin. 
Are you comforted, comforted knowing that no matter what happens, God is your father and you are his child? Remember, brothers and sisters, you have been redeemed. You have been forgiven. You have been saved. Even if the worst thing in this world happened to you today or tomorrow or this week, you are still God's child. And nothing can take that from you. Nothing nullifies the promise of God to those who have faith in Christ Jesus. We're going to look at the next section now, verses 19 through 25. And in this section, we're going to see a more explicit answer to that question that Paul poses in verse 19. Why then the law? We're going to see this. The law imprisoned us under sin. The law imprisoned us under sin. It's in this section that we finally see the answer to that question we posed at the very beginning. But before he answers it explicitly toward the end in verses 24 and 25, he sort of builds up to answer that question. So let's read verses 19 through 22 together. Paul asks that question again, and then he continues. He says, why then the law? Here's how he begins his answer. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law, then, contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul says that the law was added because of transgressions. And by this, what Paul is saying is he's saying that the law has shown to everyone just how sinful they truly are. God gave a series of commands, and he said, follow these, follow all of them, follow every single one. And the thing is, we couldn't do it. The original Israelites couldn't do it. They failed. And we today fail to live up to God's commandments, all those that are given to us. And by us failing, those laws prove to us that we were indeed sinners. Moreover, because the, the ancient Israelites broke God's laws, and because we break them today, and we break all those specific commandments given to us, their sin increases. Our sin increases. The original Israelites get commands. They break those commands. Not only now are they guilty of the sin they committed, but they're guilty of additionally disobedience to God. So through the law, sin increased for them, and they were imprisoned under that sin. Not only were they liars, adulterers, and thieves, but they were also disobedient to God and not willing to follow his instructions. Paul says that the scriptures imprisoned everyone under sin. We saw that in those verses we just read together. But this was only for a time. Only for a time. Look at verses 23 and 24. Galatians 3, 23 and 24. He further explains. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came. Until Christ came. The law served as a guardian for us. And by guardian, what Paul is saying here is he means like a prison guardian or a warden. Paul said that the law imprisoned us and guarded over us as if someone standing outside of our jail cell. And the law did this until Christ came. We are all guilty of breaking the law of Moses. And all Israelites back then were guilty of breaking the law of Moses. They were all imprisoned by their sin. And we too are all imprisoned by our sin until Christ came to do something about it. Until we put our faith in Christ. So, church, here is the final answer to that question. Now, if you stopped listening at the beginning, when I asked the question, and you've been sitting there thinking about the question or thinking about something different, now is where you can tune back in, right? We're getting the, the definitive answer to the question right here. So tune back in. Here's the answer to the question, why the law of Moses? Verses 24 and 25. Here's what Paul says. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. 
And listen to verse 25. He answers it even more clearly, stating uh, some of what he said already. Verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Brothers and sisters, the law was there to keep us for the time until that promised Messiah could come and give us freedom from the law that imprisoned us under sin. Jesus Christ came, and now we have freedom if we have faith in Christ. The law was given as a guardian until Christ could come. In other words, the law pointed forward to Christ, guarding us until the time that Christ would be revealed. The law shows us just how much we need Christ, and just how valuable Christ is to everyone who has faith in him. So why the law? It points us to Christ and shows us how much we need him. Amen. Through Christ, we are forgiven of our sins. All of the guilt, all of the shame, all of that punishment we deserved, forgiven, wiped away. Through Christ, we have adoption and acceptance and rest from all of our work that we try to do to earn salvation. The law imprisoned us. It held us captive under sin. We were not free to live for God and to love him and we're imprisoned in our sin. But brothers and sisters, now we have freedom in Christ. There was once a man sentenced to prison for 15 years. And as the end of his sentence was coming up, he was looking forward more and more to the freedom he'd experienced when he walked through those gates. Finally, the day came, and he woke up on that morning with a giddiness that couldn't be matched by anything he had experienced for 15 years. When he woke up that morning, he could not contain the excitement that was bubbling out of him. Eventually, the guards come for him, and the guards walked him out of the prison gates. When he stepped through those gates into the open sunshine, he couldn't help but dance for joy. He skipped literally down the sidewalk, basking in the freedom he now has. He went back to his family, and he reveled in the meals shared with him. And the time he had to spend with them. Soon after be, being reunited with his family, someone asked him, he says, Hey, what are you going to do now that you're out? What are you going to do with all this freedom? Faced with this question, the man has many different options, but two primary options. He can say this. He can say, well, now that I'm free, I'll go right back to what I was doing before you. I'll, I'll go and contact all my old crew members and see if they have any jobs for me. If I can just knock up a couple more stores, I'll be set for a while and won't have to do it for a long time yet. Or he can take the second option. He can use his freedom for good. He can say, I'm never going back to that life again. I'll spend time with my family. I'll work hard. I'll make something for myself. And even if no one gives me a job, I will hunt and hunt and hunt until I find a way to make it without going back to that awful place that imprisoned me. Brothers and sisters, you have been set free in Christ. You've been set free. Liberty, freedom. You were behind a jail cell, but now you are free, if indeed you have faith in Christ. What are you going to do with that freedom? What are you going to do with it today, this afternoon? What are you going to do with it tomorrow morning when you wake up? Will you use that freedom for good, or will you waste it? Will you go back to your former way of life, your former sins, or will you live for God? Mm. Brothers, sin imprisoned us and bound us to its ways, to follow its paths. Flee from sin and live in the freedom that God offers you in Christ. Mm -hmm. Love your family enough to not give in to the anger that's boiling up inside of you and, and threatening to lash out at your family. Maybe you did that before, but brothers, don't do it now. Don't lash out now. Live in the freedom that you have. Love your spouse and your kids enough to spend time with them when you do have those rare moments of free time. Don't work and work and work, and then when it's time to rest, work some more and be separated from your family. Oh, brothers and sisters, love them and spend time with them. Brothers and sisters, lay aside your guilt and your shame. 
Don't wallow in the guilt of your sins, but instead bask in the forgiveness and freedom that comes in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, enjoy the freedom that God has given you. Enjoy the love that he gives you in Christ. Enjoy it by living every single day for the Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters at Mount Carmel Baptist Church, let's look quickly at the last section of our text. We're going to see in these last three verses, verses 26 to 29, we're going to see this. Through faith we are sons of God and true heirs of Abraham's blessing. Look with me at the last three verses, verses 26 through 29. Last four verses, excuse me. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Paul gives us the reason that we're no longer under guardian. Uh, in verse 25, he says, now that faith has come, you are no longer under guardian. And then verses 26 to 29, he gives us the reason why that is. We're no longer under guardian because in Christ Jesus, we are sons of God through faith. We are sons of God through faith. We are not imprisoned by the law anymore because we are God's children. In verse 28, Paul says, we who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have been united with Christ in a baptism like his, and all believers are now a united people who are clothed in Christ's righteousness rather than being clothed in our sin and our shame. Because we are all united with Christ, we are equally children of God. With regards to salvation, we are all equal in Christ. All people, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, black or white, American or Canadian, we are all members of God's family if we have faith in Christ. Now, of course, this does not mean that there are no differences between men and women. We can see the differences between men and women plainly uh, just by interacting with each other. But even in Scripture, we see that there are differences between men and women, particularly in the roles that they serve within the church. Paul teaches that there are different roles for men and for women within the household and within the church as well. But even though there are differences in our roles, there is no differences at, difference as regard to salvation. All of us who are in Christ have been clothed by his righteousness, have been recipients of the Holy Spirit, have been, have been made children of God. God in Christ, all of us are equally his children, equally saved, equally recipients of that promised Holy Spirit. Everyone who has faith in Christ has the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, welcome all those who are around you, who are around you, who are in Christ, as you do so well. I've been so encouraged by how welcoming our church is, how welcoming you first were to me and now to everyone who walks in these doors. Brothers, as far as salvation goes, there's no difference to anyone who's in Christ. Whether they're a believer here, or in Ukraine, or Russia, or China, or uh, any number of other countries that are different from us. Whether they're a, a woman and you're a man, or they're a man and you're a woman, no difference. We are all children in Christ. We should treat them as members of God's family and love them just the same. Brothers, the message that we have here in Galatians is this. Find freedom in Christ. Find freedom in Christ. So let's find that freedom and cling to it and live in it this week. Let's pray together as we close. Oh Lord God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We thank you for the freedom that we have from the guilt of our sin. We thank you for saving us, Lord. Oh Lord, we pray that we would live in that freedom and honor you with the freedom that you've given us. Help us not to continue in sin, Lord. Don't let us go down that path back to our old ways. Help us to stay in you and maintain that freedom that we have. Oh, Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for the wonderful gift you've given to us in Christ through the Holy Spirit.
We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.